The Vegan Hall of Fame began almost 30 years ago when the North American Vegetarian Society honored Freya and Jay Dinshaw for bringing the concept of veganism to the United States. Since that time, NAVS has inducted someone new every year, carefully selected for their extensive contribution to the advancement of veganism. Recipients have varied in their manner of activism from charismatic speaking ability and prolific publishing to scientific researching and outstanding teaching ability. Some are simply exemplary models of nonviolence, and many possess all of these traits. Tonight, a new person will be inducted into the Vegan Hall of Fame, someone who we believe is one of these all-in-one people. Before announcing this year's inductee, let's take a moment to honor all of the past members. Jay and Freya Dinshaw, Helen and Scott Nearing, Michael Clapper, George Iceman. It's fine to go, go ahead and do some woos and claps and everything. Paul Obis, Mahatma Gandhi, Alex Hershaft, Muriel Gold, Patricia Lambert, Howard Lyman, Charles Stoller, and Deborah Wasserman. Brian and Sharon Graff, 45 years ago they founded this conference and they're still running it today. Richard Schwartz, T. Colin Campbell, Brenda Davis, look at that photo, yes. Joe Stepanek, Joe Connolly and Colleen Holland, Caldwell Esselstyn, Neil Barnard, Jenny Stein and James Levesque, Ray Sikora, she's in the house. John Pierre, in the house. Hans Deal. Miyoko Schinner, <laughs> Chef Mark Reinfeld in the house, or at least in the cafeteria somewhere. <laughs> Chef AJ, last year's inductee. One of the Hall of Fame traditions is that the winner's name is kept a secret until this moment in the presentation. And usually we start out by just giving a few clues as to um, who this person is, which is kind of fun, right? Yeah. Right? Kind of anticipatory? Well, tonight we're going to do it a little differently. I'm going to tell a little story. Back in 1974, a song was released that immediately hit the top 40 and the Billboard Hot 100. The song was insanely popular. And so the band recorded it again several years later, this time on a live album. The band was Leonard Skinner, the song was Freebird, and the live album was One More From The Road. Who remembers this, right? Eighth grade dances and stuff? I know I'm dating myself a little bit. I remember it, right, okay. So here's the deal. That song was so good so crazy popular, so anticipated, that when the lead singer yelled out, what song is it you want to hear? Everyone just screamed out, Freebird, Free yes. And so, dear audience, this year, instead of giving you clues, I'm going to ask you a question. And I'm pretty sure that I know how you are going to answer it. What name is it you want to hear? <laughs> well, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Raise the music.
Michael Herschel Greger was born in 1972 in Miami, Florida, into a family with his mom, Laura, a registered nurse and piano teacher and Hebrew professor, and his dad, Bob, a photographer, and his older brother, Gene. The Greggers moved a lot because his dad won a grant from the National Endowment of the Arts to photograph cemeteries all over the country. So in addition to Florida, the family also lived in New Mexico and Wyoming and Colorado and California, Arizona, and upstate New York. Michael was a precocious child, always reading, and he breezed through school reading books the entire time that were way ahead of his grade level. But he wasn't just a reader, he was also a writer. As a matter of fact, he wrote his first book when he was in elementary school, titled The Visitor's Guide to the Snakes of Australia. <laughs> now, Michael had never been to Australia before, but he loved researching. And this was the days before the internet. He loved researching, and this book came out of that passion. Now, there's a few significant things from Michael's childhood that I'd like to mention. First, his parents were passionate civil rights activists, and his father, the photographer, documented a lot of what they witnessed, such as this image that he captured in the summer of 1963 that became a famous photo published by the Associated Press. Through his parents' eyes, Michael grew to understand the critical importance of social justice, and it planted seeds for his own activism to come. Check you out. <laughs> when Michael was in sixth grade, his dad gave him a very special gift, My Experiments with Truth by Gandhi. This book emphasizes the importance of leading an authentic life. Michael took this book to heart, and people close to him say that to this day, it continues to influence his work and his life. The final thing from Michael's childhood that I mentioned here is that he watched his grandmother, Frances, go through years of pain and debilitation caused by heart disease. When she was 65, her doctors told her that there was nothing else they could do for her because she'd already had too many bypass surgeries. She had end-stage heart disease, and she was literally sent home to die. But when Frances got home, something happened that would dramatically change the course of her life and Michael's. She read about Dr. Nathan Pritikin, who was pioneering a new form of medicine that was reversing people's terminal heart disease by making changes to their lifestyle. Reversing heart disease through lifestyle changes, this was radical. But Francis Greger was curious, and so was the rest of the Greger family. So they all piled in the car, Laura, Bob, Jean, Michael, and Francis, and they drove from their home in Miami all the way to California to Pritikin's residential program, where Francis checked in and became immersed in exercise and a whole foods plant-based diet. Well, as the story goes, she rolled in in a wheelchair, and three weeks later she was walking 10 miles a day. Yes. <laughs> this woman who at the age of 65 was told that her life was over lived for another 31 years to the beautiful age of 96. As Michael grew up, he grasped the significance of his grandmother's recovery, which is that our bodies start to heal as soon as we eat foods that nourish us, and that is a plant-based diet. And as this understanding crystallized, his life's work was formed. He would become a doctor, and he would specialize in lifestyle medicine, which means using evidence-based lifestyle approaches to prevent, treat, and even reverse common chronic disease. In other words, he would do for others what Nathan Pritikin did for his family. And here's the story about how Francis Greger's grandson became the renowned Dr. Greger that we know and love. Michael went to college at Cornell University, and not surprisingly, he did a lot of reading and researching. And through his reading and researching, he learned that cows with bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or BSE for short, 
were being fed to other cows, and that the cows who were eating the sick cows were then being eaten by humans. Michael was shocked at this, so he continued his research and soon realized that BSE, otherwise known as mad cow disease, was going to be a public health problem. So he wrote a paper on BSE, and it caught the attention of Farm Sanctuary in Watkins Glen, New York. They reached out to him, and they ended up hiring him as their chief BSC investigator to investigate the dangers of feeding cows to cows and also to investigate the health risks of factory farming in general. Michael ended up going on a national speaking tour and becoming one of the country's top experts on BSC. And he was still an undergrad at this point. Now, we're going to take just a little sidebar here. One day, back when Michael was a teenager, he was flipping through his favorite magazine, National Geographic, and a photo jumped out at him. It was a picture of a puppy in a cage at a meat market. That night, while he was eating his dinner, his family dog sat by his side begging, begging for whatever he was eating. Michael looked at his dog and noticed that the look in his dog's eyes was the same look that the puppy in the photograph had. But the puppy in the cage wasn't begging for food, he was begging for his life. Michael then turned his attention to his dinner plate and realized for the first time in his life what he was eating. He realized really, really what he was eating. Now, at this point in his life, Michael had already seen his grandma save her own life with a whole foods plant-based diet. But what you might not yet realize is that her recovery had inspired Michael to start reading every single medical journal that he could get his hands on, and that this had ultimately led him to Dean Ornish's historical article in 1990 that provided evidence for the reversal of heart disease from a whole foods plant-based diet. So by the time Michael was hired as the chief BSC investigator for Farm Sanctuary, his life experiences had already led him to eat primarily a whole foods plant-based diet. But while working for Farm Sanctuary, he witnessed the realities of the stockyards, and that's what sealed the deal. He was now vegan. Michael graduated from Cornell in 1995 as a biophysics major and received a full-ride scholarship to Tufts Medical School. Now, something surprising about Michael in medical school is that instead of going to class, he usually preferred to learn by reading the textbooks cover to cover and memorizing them. And his strategy clearly worked because he did end up graduating at the top of his class. Now, because Michael's learning style was so time efficient, he was able to focus on something else very important to him, feeding the hungry, as a dedicated, devoted volunteer with Food Not Bombs. And he worked, but it's not like he went out and found a job, rather the job came to him. Because you see, Michael's reputation as a national expert on BSC had been growing this entire time. So it was only inevitable that another organization would scoop him up the way Farm Sanctuary did during his undergrad years. And this time, it was the Organic Consumers Association. They hired him to go on a national speaking tour to expose the public health dangers associated with the practice of feeding cows to cows. And then, during his second year in medical school, Michael got the phone call. <laughs> it wasn't that phone call like on that Saturday night that, you know, a different phone call. <laughs> so does anybody know who the phone call was from? Uh, not, it, 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 it's a celebrity, a very well-known person. Yes, it was Oprah Winfrey's lawyers. They were calling Michael to request his testimony as an expert witness in the infamous meat defamation trial. Now, just in case you don't remember this, I'll uh, just give you a little bit of the backstory here. On April 16th, 1996, Oprah had Howard Lyman on her show to talk about mad cow disease. And during the interview, Howard provided some pretty disturbing facts about mad cow disease that caused Oprah to say that she would never eat a hamburger again. Well, as soon as she said it, beef futures plummeted, and now the National Cattlemen's Association was suing Oprah and Howard Lyman for slander. And Oprah's lawyers needed Michael to testify that the comments made by Howard were in fact true. Well, Michael did establish the fact that Howard's comments were true, and Oprah and Lyman were found not guilty. There were several really big takeaways from the trial, 
but I'm just going to touch on one of them. And this is something that Michael has pointed out before. If the cattlemen hadn't sued, there wouldn't have been a trial. And if the trial hadn't existed, Michael Greger and Howard Lyman would not have had this unique platform to raise national awareness. Right around this time, Michael graduated from medical school, and here he is with the sign that he carried during graduation. He went on to earn a subsequent degree as a general practitioner specializing in clinical nutrition, and he published Heart Failure, Diary of a Third-Year Medical Student, in which he explains that as a teenager, he viewed medicine as a noble calling, but that as he went through medical school, he became disillusioned that modern medicine is more about controlling symptoms than removing causes, and that the medical community seems to have very little regard for the dignity and well-being of the patients they serve, especially when it comes to disadvantaged patients. But on the plus side, something else happened at this point in his life that gave him hope. He forged a long-distance friendship with an unconventional doctor who happened to be operating a free clinic in West Virginia, and the two of them bonded over their passion for social justice. You've probably heard of this doctor. His name is Patch Adams. And all of this was before his 25th birthday. And then, about 25 years ago, Michael started coming to the Vegan Summerfest. <laughs> which was back then called the Vegetarian Summerfest, and he instantly emerged as a favorite speaker. Every year, he would scour the world's scholarly literature on clinical nutrition, pulling together what he found to be the most interesting, practical, and groundbreaking science on how to eat for optimal health. And he would compile all of this information into these incredible presentations so that we didn't have to, yes. Okay, well, you know, that was a little weak, so that... <laughs> okay, great, all righty. Now, in the early years, these presentations were like game shows. Right, now, who remembers this? All right, there's a lot of people here. So, there's some people here also who don't remember, who had never saw this. I'm just gonna give you a really quick rundown. Michael would do his nutrition presentation um, in game show style, what he would do is he would put together this amazing slideshow, just like he does now. But it would include all these multiple choice or true or false questions. And he'd have everyone in the audience stand up. He would ask one of these questions. People would yell out what they thought the answer was. He would say what the answer was, and then he would explain why that was the answer. But if you got the answer wrong when you yelled it out, you would just sit down. So then there were less people standing up at that point. He would go through another question, et cetera, et cetera, until there were only a few people left in the audience, and those people would get a gift, a nutrition DVD that he had made that year. And it was just really, really fun. Now, wouldn't it be so cool to just see, like, even just a few seconds of one of those? Wouldn't that be awesome? Just for old time's sake, just a little snippet. Well, let's take a look at this. If you get the answer right, you get to remain standing. If you get the answer wrong, you need to sit down. And we'll keep going to see who the last person is standing. <laughs> Fact or fiction? Soy, increased dementia risk. What do you think? Fact. All right. See, that's good strategy against the crowd. You know, that's how you win. All right. Unfortunately, you're wrong. Fiction. <laughs> uh, it turns out that we have a small <laughs> Those were great. Now, these presentations were, were so good. They were so just funny in a really smart way that even the kids from the Children's Center started coming. The teenagers were coming, the younger kids were coming, and the real younger kids, I don't even know if they understood everything, but they just knew it was funny, and everybody started coming. But you know what? There was another reason why the kids really loved Dr. Greger. <laughs> Now, what Michael would do is he would go to the Children's Center one day during the conference and he would let them decorate him. He would, they would put like glitter on his face, glitter glue and face paint and I think you would wear like a white shirt and they would put paint all, they'd staple stuff to his clothes. It was really fun. Now, I owe you an apology, Michael, because um, my, my son is now in his 20s, but back when he was about six, 
one day he met me after being in the children's center um, for the morning or the afternoon. He met me at mealtime and he said, Mom, guess what? Dr. Greger was at the children's center today and I took a lipstick and I put it in his ear and I went like this. And there were all kinds of other kids doing stuff at the same time. I'm pretty sure that was actually the last year that you did it. Yeah, that was the last year. I thought so. Anyway, I've owed you an apology for many... Anyway. Well, well, we'll we'll move on from that. Oh, by the way, nice uh, photo bomb, Dad. <laughs> That's you. Okay. All right. We'll move on now. In the mid 2000s, low carb diets were on the rise, and Dr. Greger knew that the health claims made by the low carb advocates were seriously flawed. So he decided to balance out what the media was promoting with actual science. So he published Carbophobia, which is essentially an encyclopedia of low-carb research. Because as he explains, there was literally a century of data out there about the potential dangers of low-carb diets, but none of it was making it out to the public. Moving on in the timeline to 2004. Remember Michael's disillusionment back in medical school because doctors were treating symptoms, not causes? Well, other healthcare professionals who shared his ideals were starting to emerge. Now, Dr. Greger has said many times that most doctors are really good at treating acute illnesses, but bad at preventing chronic disease. And that's what made this group of doctors different. They didn't want to prescribe a pill. They wanted to prescribe lifestyle changes that would make the pills and their side effects unnecessary. So Michael and these doctors joined together to found the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. So who's heard of that term before, lifestyle medicine? All right, yeah, a lot of people have heard of that term. But back then, the term lifestyle medicine was essentially unheard of. But now, 15 years after the ACLM was formed, lifestyle medicine is considered the future of healthcare. And get this, two years ago, lifestyle medicine became an official field of medicine. So thank you, Dr. Greger, and your pioneer colleagues for this massive advance in the field of medicine. And all throughout this time, Dr. Greger's reputation as one of the country's highest authorities on nutrition research was growing, and he became a highly sought-after speaker. So eventually, he had to transform those crazy Summerfest game show presentations into something more formal, because ultimately it wouldn't just be us that would be seeing the presentations, it would be the world. Because you see, Dr. Greger's annual Summerfest presentation literally became the premiere of an annual world tour. He would debut it here and then take it on the road all over the country and to Europe, Australia, China, and now, after all these years, Dr. Greger's annual review of the research has become a true hallmark of the Vegan Summerfest. And I know that I speak for a lot of us here tonight when I say that we're proud and honored that you choose the Summerfest each year for your premiere. <clears throat> Except for last year <clears throat> when you couldn't make it. <clears throat> Um, okay. <laughs> in 2007, Dr. Greger wrote Bird Flu, a virus of our own hatching, to explain how an airborne virus from animals has been responsible for pandemics that have killed tens of millions of people over the last century. And in 2011, he founded NutritionFacts.org with seed money and support from the Jesse and Julie Rash Foundation. Who's ever heard of NutritionFacts.org? Anybody? <laughs> NutritionFacts.org, as I know everybody knows, is a website in which Dr. Greger puts out a daily video showing the latest in nutrition research. The topics hit on nearly every single aspect of healthy eating. And to get a sense of just how vast the subject matter is and how high the sheer number of videos there are, this image represents 1% of the total number of videos. Can you imagine 100 of these slides, all totally different? That's nutritionfacts.org. And every single one of the videos is easy to understand and contains Dr. Greger's signature humor and his signature animation. 
And each one even comes with written doctor's notes for people who want to dig deeper into the subject. Now, nutritionfacts.org is a 501c3 public service, which of course means that advertising isn't accepted, so there's no commercial influence on the videos. And I'd like to say something about how this website truly is a public service. When a new drug or surgery goes on the market, everyone hears about it because of corporate advertising budgets, right? It's on TV, the doctors are wined and dined by the drug companies, they give out free samples, they give out millions of pens with the drug's name on it, you know what I mean. But when it comes to advances in nutrition, there's no whining and dining. There's no TV ads, there certainly aren't any pens, there's nothing because there's no profit motive. So nutritionfacts.org is a public service in that it delivers crucial information that would otherwise not get out. One other thing about the site. When Dr. Greger started it in 2011, it was just him. Now, can you tell that that's him in that picture? <laughs> kind of, that, that is like, that is, that is you. Um, it is your, it's your, it's your head anyway. Um, it's a tiny little picture, I know. When Dr. Greger started it in 2011, it was just him. But as the site grew, he recruited volunteers, and as donations increased, he hired staff. And today, he's got an entire team that enables him to go through about 1,300 nutrition papers every year, and the site now contains 2,000 videos. Well done, Michael. Yes. Awesome. In 2015, Flatiron Books published How Not to Die by Dr. Michael Greger. Now, first of all, just to make sure we're all on the same page, this is not a book that teaches people how to never die, obviously. Rather, the book's message is that there are ways to die, like having a peaceful death following years of health and vitality, and there are ways to not die, such as dying prematurely after years of pain and debilitation. How Not to Die examines the top 15 causes of death in America and explains how nutrition and lifestyle interventions can be more effective and more long-lasting and less harmful than pharmaceutical and surgical approaches. How Not to Die was an immediate New York Times bestseller and it's received almost 3,000 five-star reviews on Amazon and an endorsement from the Dalai Lama and it even appears in the background of an episode of The Good Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> On the heels of How Not to Die came Dr. Greger's How Not to Die cookbook, also an instantaneous New York Times bestseller showing how to take delicious, life-saving action in the kitchen. And the recipes include Dr. Greger's Daily Dozen, which are the foods he says that we should eat as often as possible. And this winter, How Not to Diet will be released, in which Dr. Greger shows, well, we know what it shows, because you just gave that awesome presentation. Congratulations on all of these books. <laughs> By the way, all of the proceeds from Dr. Greger's books are donated to nutritionfacts.org. Very awesome, worthy cause. Now, I've hit the major highlights from Dr. Greger's professional career, but there's just a few more things that I want to mention. His articles have been published in the International Journal of Food Safety, Nutrition, and Public Health, the American Journal of Preventative Medicine, Critical Reviews in Microbiology, Family and Community Health, the American Journal of Lifestyle Medicine, and Integrative Medicine, a Clinician's Journal, to name just a few. He's lectured at the Conference on World Affairs, the National Institutes of Health, the International Bird Flu Summit, and hundreds of other health-related events. He's testified before Congress about the public hazards of factory farms and on the fact that diet is the number one cause of premature death in the United States. He's appeared on The Colbert Report, The Dr. Oz Show, Fox and & Friends, and The Kelly & Ryan Show, and he has his own PBS special. He's been featured on the Healthy Living Channel, and he's an instructor for Dr. T. Colin Campbell's plant-based nutrition course through Cornell University. He's a member of the Council of Directors of the True North Health Initiative, which is the world's highest authority on lifestyle medicine. This council of just 350 people from all over the world is an unprecedented assembly of professionals who are responsible for disseminating and demonstrating the global consensus on healthy eating and healthy living. In 2017, 
The American College of Lifestyle Medicine presented Michael with its prestigious Trailblazer Award for his exemplary leadership and innovation. Susan Benegas is the ACLM Executive Director, and she says that Michael is an unwavering champion of lifestyle medicine. A few others have something to say about Michael, such as Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, who applauds Michael for his past and future decades of purpose toward the health of humankind. And T. Colin Campbell, who says that Michael is a whirlwind of information and a great asset to the plant-based movement. Mr. Encyclopedia over there. <laughs> and Dr. Dean Ornish, who calls Michael a national treasure and says that his vast fund of knowledge is exceeded only by his impeccable integrity. To conclude, I'd like to mention something about Michael that a lot of us might not realize. If you take a look at his early videos, they're not polished, but he has not taken them down from his website, and here's why. These videos are evidence of where Michael began, before the bestsellers, before the TV shows, before nutritionfacts.org. These videos are proof that if we dedicate enough time to something we're passionate about, then we can get better at it. And I'm going to say that again because I know there are people in the audience right now to hear, who need to hear this. If we dedicate enough time to something we're passionate about, we can get better at it. Michael takes this concept very seriously, and that's why he regularly helps others figure out how they too can be most effective in their activism without waiting for a team of volunteers, or waiting for a paid staff, or waiting for a special degree. You know, it's interesting. When I asked the executive director of nutritionfacts.org for a testimonial for Michael, one of the first things that she said is that he has an uncompromising commitment to helping others. And Patch Adams, he says that Michael shows the empowerment of social justice through his caring, and he thanks NAVS for giving him this honor. In my experiments with truth, Gandhi wrote that men often become what they believe themselves to be. If I believe I cannot do something, it makes me incapable of doing it. But when I believe I can, then I acquire the ability to do it even if I didn't have it in the beginning. Michael, we have all benefited from the fact that these words are your truth. And I know we can further benefit by following your example. Why don't you come on up? Michael, you have dedicated your life, oh, I love looking at you right now. You have, you have dedicated your life to educating the world about the benefits of a plant-based diet, and you do it in such a unique manner. No one matches you, and the world is a better place because you're in it. On behalf of the board, welcome to the Vegan Hall of Fame. You know, people often ask me how I managed to get so much done. And my answer used to be threefold. Number one, no kids, <laughs> except furry ones. Number two, a very accommodating partner who is actually here today, Breeze, my beloved, waved everybody. And my third secret to productivity, sleep deprivation. Okay, but now I get enough sleep. Why? Because 20 years ago, as Mary Beth said, um, around when I started to come to Summerfest, I was just a lone doc, but now I have a whole nonprofit organization of my own, nutritionfacts.org. So now I get enough sleep because I have an amazing team 
um, working with me, some of whom are also here today. If I can find them, I'd like to introduce you to Katie, our executive director. Where are you? Where? Oh, up here, way up here. Also, Kate, our Senior Director of Programs. We are proud to be a women-led organization. We also have Dustin, our Graphic Design Director, and Jeff and Luke we have as well here today. Came out to help film this week. Thank you so much. I could not have done it without you. I remember uh, one of my first summer fests, you know, 20 or so years ago, uh, when Howard Lyman was inducted. And I looked up at that list and I said, I want to be on any list that has Dr. Clapper and Mahatma Gandhi. Like, <laughs> um, and I said, you know, one of these days. And then. Uh, Professor Campbell got in, Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Barnard, Dr. Deal, my heroes, and I was just waiting. <laughs> Patiently. <laughs> and something you'll see missing from the presentation, um, which may strike someone as odd, my 13 years as public health director of the Humane Society of the United States. And it's interesting, actually a board member of NAVS actually took me aside and explained to me that the reason that I was not going to be inducted into the Vegan Hall of Fame is because I worked for the Humane Society of the United States and I just thought how, how strange it was that a vegan organization would slight me for working for a group that arguably has done more for farm animals than almost any other group out there. Now I've uh, since left um, HSUS to concentrate full-time on nutrition, um, and so obviously now I'm eligible again. Um, but you know, I definitely want to take this opportunity to clear up any confusion about HSUS. The Humane Society of the United States is the only organization currently offering plant-based culinary trainings at these institutional dining programs like schools and hospitals and military bases. They've trained more than 9,000 food service professionals on reducing meat, dairy, and eggs. 12.9 million farm animals saved just through their Meatless Mondays programs at schools alone. In my mind, In my mind, they are the unsung heroes of the vegan movement, uh, reducing meat intake by the millions of servings at a time. I was proud to be their public health director, just as I am proud to receive this today. Thank you so much. That was so great.